What's going on, Valley Christian Church? It's so good to see you all today. For anybody who doesn't know who I am, I'm Pastor Stephen Francis, and I'm here to fill in for Dr. Greg today during our sermon in this series from this day forward. Now, I don't know about anybody else in here, but I have to admit, I've been getting so much incredible content from this series. You know, the first week we talked about seeking God together as a couple. Second week we talked about fighting fair as a couple. And last week, we had a lot of fun talking about having fun as a couple. And listen, I think no matter where you are in life, there has been content talked about in in order for you to get from and make you a better person. But we all have to admit, all of these sermons so far have been towards married couples. Well, today, I'm here to represent for the singles. So if you're single in here, can you do me a favor real quick? Can you just make some noise for me? Raise your hand, both here and out Poughkeepsie, so I can see where you're at. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) Listen, I love my single people. I was actually single not too long ago myself. As a matter of fact, May 25th of this year, I got married to the most beautiful girl in the world named Jasmine. Here's a picture of us on our wedding day. She's cute, right? I, I know. Listen, not only did we have a beautiful wedding day, but we also had an incredible honeymoon. We went to Paris for our honeymoon. Here's a picture of us in front of the Eiffel Tower on our honeymoon. It was a beautiful trip, beautiful wedding, and so far just such a great marriage. You know, a lot of people always ask, how did Jasmine and I meet? So I kind of wanted to take the time now to tell you a little bit about our story. Jasmine and I met when we were both students at Liberty University in Virginia. Now, she was a sophomore, I was a senior, and we met through some mutual friends. And I thought she was so attractive, but at the same time, I couldn't really ask her out because we lived on opposite side of campus, and, you know, we just didn't have any similar classes together. However, my mutual friend told me that she needed a ride for the holidays at the end of the year. So I jumped at the opportunity to offer her a ride. She said yes. And we had an eight-hour car ride from Virginia all the way up here to New York. And guys, I kid you not, in that entire eight-hour car ride, I used every ounce of game that I could find (laughs) in order to let her think that I was cool and that she should go on a date with me. Well, it worked. We went on our first date. Our first date was a play of Peter Pan. And then also I took her to Buffalo Wild Wings. (laughs) Because that's where you go when you're a broke college student and you want to treat someone to the finer things in life. That's, that was the situation. But either way, it's just so amazing to me to think that that one date from that Buffalo Wild Wings has now turned into a lifelong commitment with my best friend. And speaking of which, when it comes to that, I think so many of us, I know I did this before I met Jasmine, and many of you guys who are single in here right now, a lot of us love to think about who is that person going to be that we're gonna have that lifelong relationship with. What are they gonna look like? Uh, How are we gonna meet them? Uh, You know, what things will we do, places we'll go, what kids we may have? And you know, I think that's something that so many of us, especially when you're single, love to do. We love to dream and idolize about who that dream person is going to be. But the ironic thing is this, is that even though so many of us love to dream and idolize about who that perfect person will be and what that happy relationship will be, many of us are living in nightmares of loneliness, desperation, and heartbreak. There could be some people in here right now, you've just been single so long that you're starting to give up on the idea that you'll ever find somebody. And maybe you should just get used to the idea of possibly dying alone. There's some people in here right now where you have been dating. And matter of fact, you've been dating person after person after person, hoping to find the right one, but pretty much all you have is just a trail of heartbreak behind you. There's some people in here right now where you thought maybe you did find the right person. You thought you you found the person of your dreams and you were going to live happily ever after, but they showed their true personality. Maybe certain things occurred and now you're in a bad breakup or possibly even divorced and you're wondering what where do i go from here how do i find the right person to move on well church today my job is to give you biblical and practical advice that will help you find a happy healthy relationship 
which is why I'm calling this sermon today, Real Dating for the Real World. Now, before I get into anything, I first need to talk to my married people in here. My married people, both here and at Poughkeepsie, can you make some noise for me real quick? Can you show your hands so I can see you? This is a strong number in here. This is good. Listen, married people, I love you guys. I am one of you guys, and I admit that there must be a big temptation right now to kind of tune out because it's like I'm married, I've been through this, I don't need this. But I want to challenge you right now to actually be just as attentive as the single people. Take just as many notes, because here's the truth. Being a married person, there's going to come a time when somebody needs insight on how to find the right person and how to make a relationship work. It could be your children one day. It could be a friend, a coworker, another relative. And you just want to be sure that the advice that you give them is biblical and practical for their lives. And that's what I believe I have for you today. So with that said, let's dive into it. Real dating for the real world. Now, there's one thing I believe that we all need to understand, especially my single people, in order to better help you in dating. And that is this, that there is no such thing as a soulmate. And this is what I mean by the idea of a soulmate. I mean the idea that there is a person with the right personality, looks, and gifts that will let you be happy, content, and complete. It's that fairy tale, romantic movie, Jerry Maguire, you complete me type of relationship that we're talking about here when I refer to a soulmate. And you know, I think so many of us in here have heard that before and we've sought after it and we thought we even had it, but we actually kind of experienced something different. For instance, how many of you guys in here, you had a point in your life where you met someone who you thought was the one, it was like love at first sight. You guys got along together, you thought the person was so attractive and you had so much fun and people even were rooting your relationship on. And you figured, man, this is it. This is going to be the person I spend the rest of my life with. But then fast forward just to today and that same person who you thought was the one, now you're kind of like, I have no idea what I was thinking when I was dating that person. (laughs) Has anyone ever had an experience like that before? It was kind of like, that was kind of a big mistake on my part. Happy I moved on from that relationship. I know I have. And the biggest question you usually have when you have a relationship like that and you come out of it is how do you know if you find the right person? How can you make sure that the next person you're dating is not like the person that you were just with? That's the question I get all the time as a pastor and also as someone who got married so young. And my answer to that question of how to find the right person is always this, that that's actually the wrong question. The better question to ask is how do you know if you're the right person? Because here's the truth, you could come across the right person and still have a bad relationship because you weren't ready for it. And you know, I believe that the Bible also backs me up on this. Scripture does not say anything really about God making somebody specifically for you to make you complete. But it does say this, Proverbs 18, 22 reads, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. You know, in the original language, this basically translates to say that he who looks and picks for a good wife receives favor from the Lord. And this is important to understand because basically it means that the person you date and marry will always be based upon your decisions and not your destiny. And that's not to say that God won't bring somebody into your life one day for you to consider, but it does mean that you need to be as spiritually and mentally ready to know that person and make the decision to be with that person as opposed to making many times the foolish decisions that a lot of us do in dating. Because the thing is, so many of us love to just turn our brains off when it comes to the romance of relationships. We meet somebody, they make us happy, and we're we're just kind of happy we're not alone anymore, anymore watching Netflix on the couch. So we're just so into the relationship. And many times that causes us to ignore the red flags that may be there in a relationship. You know, red flags are supposed to be the easiest sign for you to see that maybe the relationship you're in is not one you should continue being in. But we can just get so caught up in emotion that we just kind of ignore those red flags instead. And why is that? I think sometimes we just get so caught up in how attractive the person looks, the job they may have, and the way they may make us feel. 
And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. As a matter of fact, I think that you should want to be with someone who's attractive. You should want to be with someone who makes you feel happy. But all of those things are what I like to call entry-level criteria for a dating relationship. The problem is, too many of us make entry-level criteria for a relationship the only level of criteria for a relationship. And when you have low dating standards like that and entering into a relationship, when red flags come your way, usually one of three things happen. One, like I mentioned, is you kind of ignore the red flags. Second is you see the red flags and you try to analyze the person and try to see if you can fix that person in order they so that they fit the image of who you want them to be with. It's that, oh man, if I could just get this person to church and then they'll get saved and then they'll be the person who I want them to be or maybe they'll get this job that I want them to get and then they'll be the person. But that never really works because no one wants to be in a relationship with somebody that doesn't accept them for who they already are. The second uh, the third thing, rather, that happens is many times when we see the red flags and we have low criteria in dating is that we'll raise our white flag to the red flags and begin to believe that this relationship we're in is maybe just for the best, that these things that we see as issues will hopefully work themselves out and maybe we'll live happily ever after after all. Now, this doesn't work, and I'll tell you how through this story. You know, I told this story to the 20-somethings group, and by the way, if you're someone in your 20s and you're not in the 20-somethings group, you are missing out. We have so much fun together, great preaching, great fun. Sign up today, all right? <laughs> That's my little shameless plug. But back to the story. Um, the previous church that I worked at, I had the privilege of doing many different type of counseling sessions for uh, different people. And I'll never forget this particular incident where I met with a couple who had been married for eight years, but the wife was getting ready to leave her husband. I asked why, and she told me that in the eight years of her marriage to her husband, that he was spending hundreds of dollars on pornography behind her back. He began becoming so caught up in the pornography that he started to seek out having affairs with other women through certain apps that you can download on your phone. He was unsuccessful in having those affairs, but he became so desperate in seeking out one that he used his tax return money to hire a prostitute. She found out. She couldn't take it anymore. She was ready to leave. I was heartbroken for her even hearing this story. But there was a question I needed to ask her so I could get better understanding. I asked her this, what was he like before you married him? What caused him to be this way? And she told me this, that even before she married him, that she knew that he had a porn habit. But she figured that once they get married and they have their own sexual relationship, that maybe he'll get over it and put it away. She even said that before they got married, that he was super flirtatious with other women, sometimes even crossing the line beyond flirtation. But she kind of threw it off as boys will be boys and that eventually things will work itself out and they'll live happily ever after. She admitted she was wrong, and I told her this, and this is the same thing I want to tell you, that that woman was not a victim of her husband. She was a volunteer. And so many of us volunteer ourselves into bad relationships because we make bad decisions when it comes to the person we should be with. We get too caught up in the emotions of it and the happiness that that person gives us. And then we ignore the red flags or, you know, uh, or submit to them. And that's why I believe this idea of being the soulmate of this person that can complete you and make you happy all the time can be a dangerous thing. So instead, I believe in this. Don't wait for a soulmate. Search for a soul mate. S-O-L-E mate. What do I mean by that? Search for someone who shows the qualifications to walk with you wherever you are in life. You know, you're going to have good times and bad times, like the wedding vows. You're going to have times in sickness and in health, rich or poor, for better or worse type of situations. And you need to be sure that the person that you're with shows the qualifications to walk with you in both the good times and the bad. 
So the question then is, how do you know when you found that type of person? How do you know when you found a soulmate? I'm going to show you how in a little bit. The first thing we're going to do is talk about developing you. Because the better you are, both spiritually and emotionally, the better you'll be at finding who that right person is. So let's talk about it. Things you need to do to develop you. First thing is this. You need to have an identity and vision from Christ. You know, week one we talked about this in Seeking God of our series. And then also, if you've been in church for any long period of time, you've probably heard this before as well. But I can't stress enough how important this is because we live in a world where people love to find their identity and purpose in whatever they can find. From the jobs they have to the likes on their Instagram or Facebook, the things that they own. But the number one way I believe people try to find identity and love is through intimate relationships with other people. Finding that person that makes you feel good about yourself and gives you the love that you don't have for yourself. And many times when we have that perspective when it comes to dating, it causes us to date in order to get our needs met and for us to become desperate. That even causes for us to be more sexual promiscuous in our relationships because we use sex as almost like a glue to keep someone attracted to us so we can continue to feel the love we need. You know, I believe that the person who dates out of desperation is like how the starving person looks for food. You know, like I said before, I married Jasmine, and Jasmine is part of the Johnson family here in this church. You know, a lot of you guys know the Johnson family for a lot of different things. The way they lead, the way they serve, the way they sing even. But I know the Johnson family for a completely different reason, and that is the food that comes out of the Johnson house. I don't know if anybody in here has had a Johnson family meal before, but I promise you it is some of the, I hear that hand, <laughs> it is some of the best food you may ever have in your life. Every Sunday, Jasmine and I are at her parents' house eating all types of goodness. I'm talking about steak. I'm talking about barbecue chicken. I'm talking about, um, you know, ribs. I'm talking about Italian food. Whatever you think is good, it is coming off the stove at the Johnson house, guaranteed. And I'll say this as well. My mother-in-law, Karen Johnson, she makes the best macaroni and cheese you may ever have in your life. I'm talking about life-changing. You could be an atheist and turn into a believer in Jesus Christ by the time you finish the macaroni and cheese. It's that type of good. And the apple does not fall far from the tree. My wife also makes such delicious meals. So much so, in fact, that when I come in to work for lunch and they see what I have, uh, you know, usually it's leftovers from the night before, I got people looking at me like, I hope that brother got a gym membership or something because <laughs> this is a serious situation. And they absolutely right. Like, I really got to, yeah, I got to do something. But, <laughs> but I eat so good. And I eat so good that it almost seems crazy for me to ever want to eat at a fast food restaurant. Which is good because we all know fast food isn't good for us, right? But at the same time, how many of us, by show of hands here in Poughkeepsie, will admit that even though we know fast food is not good for us, we still eat it anyway? Me too. And you know why that is? It's because even though we know that anything we get at home is more delicious and nutritious for us, at the same time, sometimes we just get so hungry and impatient that we'll settle for whatever is fast and convenient instead. What's my point? My point is God has way more purpose and love and identity that we can get from anywhere else. But so many of us don't realize that, so we settle for any relationship or job or something we can get our hands on in order to find that love and purpose. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is this, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You know why I love this verse so much? It's because this verse is true whether you are single or whether you are married, whether you are healthy or sick, 
skinny, big, wherever you are on the spectrum, if you are in Christ, this is who you are. And this is so important to know because when you have this, it causes you to no longer date out of need. It no longer causes you to feel like being single is like some curse on your life and you have to find a relationship to fix it. It causes you to date out of an overflow that God has given you in your heart. And I believe it does something else too. I believe having your identity in Christ also gives you a vision for your life. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says this, without vision, people cast off restraint. When you have a vision for your life, you'll automatically have better standards for yourself and whoever you date. You know, before I met Jasmine and got married to her, I knew that God wanted me to be a pastor. So because of that, I knew that I needed to not date somebody who wasn't a Christian. I knew to not date somebody who said they were a Christian, but they weren't actively involved in church. And that's not because I think I'm better than them or that they were bad people, but God put me on a path for my life that I knew that the person I needed to be with was who was someone who could run on that same path with me. And that was the same thing when it came to sexual and physical boundaries. I knew to keep those boundaries because of what God had for me and me wanting the fullness of what he had to offer. So I kind of want to cement this in a way by painting an image for you guys that I believe will stick. And this may sound a little silly at first, but I promise you it's super profound. And that's this right here. Learn to be an eagle and not a duck. (laughs) Think about this with me for a second. You know, an eagle and a duck are both birds, but they have nothing else in common. Eagles soar above the crowds, and they're majestic creatures. People take pictures of them when they see them. Ducks, they just kind of waddle along in their flocks, and they sometimes stop traffic, and they poop all over your car. Like, they're a problem. But eagles and birds, they don't fly the same. They don't hunt the same. They don't interact with other birds the same. They are completely different. And if an eagle ever tried to be in a relationship with a duck, it would never work because the eagle could not live up to its full potential in that relationship. And I believe that if you're in here right now and if you've given your life to Christ, that God has made you to be an eagle. And you have eagle-like capabilities and you have eagle-like goals for your life that he has given you, but you may not realize it yet, so you keep dating ducks. And that's why I believe that it is so important that if you're single right now, that you consider this a time to learn what it means to be an eagle, to fly like one, to hunt like one, to, re- to appreciate God for making you one. And the more you do that, the more you'll be better able to spot and avoid an eagle when it, uh, excuse me, a duck when it comes your way, and also attract other eagles to yourself. Now, that was my little animal planet analogy. Thank you so much for letting me do that. (laughs) We'll continue with the rest of the sermon. Second thing that we need to do is that we need to deal with our issues. Les and Leslie Parrott say this, and these are popular psychologists and writers, that if you attempt to build intimacy with a person before you've done the hard work of becoming a whole and healthy person, every relationship will be an attempt to complete the whole in your heart. You know, so many of us are seeking to be in a relationship right now, but we've got a lot of scars from maybe issues with a parent, a family divorcing, splitting up, maybe physical or emotional abuse. There could be some people in here where you got out of a divorce and you're still dealing with the scars of that. And so many times we get into relationships thinking that that will make it better, when in reality, Because those things aren't healed, we end up hurting the other person through those issues. So I want to tell you to take the time to just let God heal those wounds, to be in a community group and discuss those things, to find counseling even. You know, we just got out of a great series called Baggage, and Dr. Greg talked all about this. Go back and listen to that sermon series in order to better help you for the future. The third thing that we need to do is break out of bad habits. Every person in here who's married can vouch for me when I say this, that marriage always makes the good things better and the bad things worse. So if you're someone who talks way too much now and doesn't listen, you will talk way too much later and not listen in a relationship. 
if you drink too much now when you're single, you're going to drink too much in a relationship. If you have a porn habit now, you're going to have a porn habit in a relationship. If you're lazy and can't hold a job now, you're going to be lazy and not hold a job in a relationship. You guys get my point, right? Deal with those bad habits now. Because right now when you're single, that's the time for you to get over those things so that when you're in a relationship, someone else doesn't have to deal with those issues either. Fourth thing is this. Make yourself more marriageable. Now, if you're single in here, I believe that you are probably looking to have a happy relationship with someone who accepts you for who you are. To which I say, amen, absolutely. That's what you should have. But I also believe in the same way that you uh, go out for a job, the same way you apply for a college or anything else, you want to be sure that you're presenting the best you that you can be, both internally and externally. So what does that mean for a lot of single people? That just means have good hygiene. That just means wear nice clothes. For a lot of people, that just means, you know, educate yourself. If you're someone who's socially awkward now, deal with that. So you're someone who could be more approachable. Deal with those things now so that once somebody sees you, they're attracted to you both inward and outward as well. Now, I'm not saying at all with these things that I mentioned that you need to be perfect with these things. And when you're perfect, the right person will come. But I do believe that this is something you should definitely commit to. And the more you do commit to these things, the better you'll be at being able to spot and attract other people your way. And when those things start happening and you start going on those dates and having those interactions with people, then you need to ask the question, how do you know when you found the soulmate? Well, I'm going to tell you how through these three things that I believe are the soulmate test. Three things. First part of the soulmate test, they have to pass the interviews, which means you need to ask a lot of questions. I wrote down some questions here for you guys so you can see them. First question is this, what are your intentions? This is big for all my Christian ladies in here especially because you got a lot of guys who are going to ask you out and they, there's going to be some that mean well. There's going to be some that they're going to want to know you and see if this can go further in dating and possibly marriage. And then there's some other ones that want to be with you for a lot of other reasons. So be sure that you're, you ask up front, what are your intentions so you know what they're about? Second thing, are you being changed by your relationship with God? I frame this question specifically like this because if someone says that they're a Christian or spiritual, which I don't get what that is, but if someone says that they're a Christian, that's not a good enough answer. Be sure that they are being changed by their relationship with God. They're seeking God for themselves. They're being involved in community group or serving, leading somehow. Be sure that they have that type of relationship with God. Third, how do you treat your parents? We're going to start shooting through these real quick. How do you treat your parents? What are your friends like? If you think you found an eagle and all his friends are ducks, he's a duck. Just say. <laughs> What was the last person you dated like? Have they ever cheated? What are you passionate about? Do you have a job? <laughs> Is that your dream job? What are your goals? Do you consider yourself a consistently honest person? Do you struggle with anger? That's big. Do you like and want children? Where do you stand on politics? Listen, when I read this list, this may seem kind of invasive at first for someone who's dating, but I promise you, and I feel anybody who's in here who's married can vouch for me, these things matter. You want to be sure that the person you're with can answer these questions in a way where you feel confident of who you're with. So ask the questions, make them pass the interviews. Second thing, let them meet the friends and family. Biggest mistake I see a lot of people do is they'll enter into a relationship and they'll just disappear off the face of the earth. They'll isolate themselves and they'll begin to think that the person that they're with is their entire world. I want to challenge you to do the opposite. Instead, let them meet your friends and family and let them also give you their opinion about them. Because it says a lot when the people you love like the person you like. 
you know, I want to tell this quick story. Back when I was in high school, I thought I met the girl of my dreams. I thought she was so fly and that we were going to live happily ever after. And I knew before I could go any further that she had to meet my mother. So one day my mother picked me up from high school and, you know, I brought the girl outside and I was like, hey, mom, listen, I want you to meet the future Mrs. Francis right here. My mother said, oh, hello, it's so nice to meet you. Hey, listen, we got to go, but you have a nice day, all right? And the girl was like, okay, cool, nice to meet you too. And she turned around to walk away. And my mom, who had the smile from the girl, looked at me with a straight face and was like, absolutely not. <laughs> now get in the car. <laughs> the problem was the girl didn't walk away far enough for her not to hear my mother say that. <laughs> so needless to say, it was a little bit of a problem. But the thing was, even though I was so mad at my mom for that incident, the fact was she was absolutely right, because mothers know. So let the people that you love meet the person that you like so they can give you their opinion on them and support you in that relationship as well, because they want the best for you just as much as you do. Third thing is you got to set and keep biblical boundaries. And I believe this is important, and it will help fashion your relationship, because when you have biblical boundaries for how far you'll go physically, even emotionally, it shows a lot about the person if they can hold to those standards as well. It shows that they can honor God. It shows that they can respect you, and they're just character in general. Truth be told, statistics are consistently show that if someone can't keep their hands off you now when you're dating, chances are they won't be able to keep their hands off you, off someone else, excuse me, when you're in a relationship or married. So keep that in mind. Now, all those three things were the relationship test. But before I finish up, let me just give you guys some last pieces of advice from a pastor to a church. First thing is this. Don't date with your imagination date with your intellect. If the person you're dating is, you know, not passing any of the interviews, if your friends and family don't like them, or even they can't set and keep biblical boundaries, don't date that person imagining that they're going to one day become the person you wish them to be. Intellect says, listen, this is not the person for me. I need to walk away. And honestly, there's seven billion people in the world. I'm sure eventually I'll find the right one. Second piece of advice, don't act married till you're married. There's a lot of couples out here who are living together, who are taking a bunch of private vacations together, who are paying one another's bills and things, you know, sleeping together. And all of those things are things that are reserved for a marriage relationship and should be respected in that context. If you're a Christian in here, that's something that you want and you should look for. But why well, why give someone all of that for free when the Bible says that that should be a commitment that they give for a lifetime? So be sure you're not acting married till you're married. Last piece of advice, if you're a guy, step up, and if you're a girl, step back. You know, I think there's a lot of great Christian women who are single and have sometimes even considered dating unbelievers because there's just Christian guys who just haven't stepped to the plate and asked them out. And if you're a Christian guy in here and if you're single, my challenge is just ask a girl out. If you think she's cute, just ask her out. If she says no, fine, move on. But if you think she's worth it, figure out a way for her to say yes. In context, don't creep her out, don't stalk her, don't, don't do any of those things. But pursue her. Like I said before, it took me eight hours in a car ride to get Jasmine to say yes to me. But I tell you what, I can't get mad at the results, people. Just saying. And if you're a girl and you like a guy, allow a man to pursue you the way that you deserve to be pursued. You can smile at him. You can bake him some cookies. You can even say, listen, I think you're cool. We should hang out sometime. But if he can't take enough initiative from there to pursue you the way that you as a woman should be pursued, quite honestly, that is not a man you want to be with. So keep that in mind. Now, with all that said, I'm done. But before, <laughs> but before I go, I just want to leave one last piece of advice. And this isn't from me. This is actually from Pastor Andy Stanley at North Point Church. Are you who the person you're looking for is looking for? 
And I believe when you have this question in mind, this will better help shape you and, and prepare you for being in a relationship. You know, like I said before, I don't believe in the idea of a soulmate, but I do believe that God will bring the right person to your life at the right time. But much of that will come when you start to grow spiritually, emotionally, and, and you put yourself in a place where if God feels you're ready to be in that relationship. And in that preparation phase, I'll also say this. Bible doesn't say a lot about how to find the right person, but when you seek God about being the right person, the Bible opens up with all types of wisdom and insight for you to take hold of. So with that said, I want to pray for all you guys here that are single as a pastor. Let's do it together. Jesus, I'm so grateful for you and for the amazing way that you do the things that you do. And God, there are people in here right now who have been single for a long time. People have been dating. People who are still dealing with the hurt of past relationships. And Jesus, I first pray, Lord, that you comfort those people, that you give healing to those people where healing is needed. But I also pray this, that, Father, that you prepare their hearts, that they seek you, that they trust in you, and that you bring them one day to have a happy, healthy relationship that doesn't make them feel complete or whole, but it's just another way for them to glorify you who has already completed them and made them whole through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you and believe all these things are done. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.